I've seen other games actually going into the NFT market, which is actually mm -hmm. astounding because you see many companies actually branding their users and characters as NFTs and with direct link to the, to the wall. Casual games is an increasingly challenging segment. Costs per install are up. ROAS is down. IDFA deprecation continues to take a toll and competition is truly global now. To deep dive into the casual games business, we're spending some time with two mobile experts. Peggy, who are they? Well, John, we have Jonathan Winters, Director of Performance Marketing at Miniclip. His career in mobile gaming started way back in 2014. If that is a while back, I don't know. But when he joined Miniclip, that is where he's also stayed to this day. And there he built up Miniclip's UA department, launching a long list of games at global scale. In 2020, he became Miniclip's Director of Performance Marketing, where he oversees UA, creative production, ASO, influencer marketing, the works. He loved oh. to orchestrate a great UA team and works very hard at it. And maybe that orchestration, that interest in bringing together such a team may have its roots in music because a little known fact you won't read in his LinkedIn profile, John, his first job was teaching music to kids. Nice. 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 Thank you so much for having me. Great okay. to have you, Jonathan. And up next, John, we have David Pish. He is head of business development at Funorama. And he's also made it here between flights and a world tour indeed. So uh, he is a passionate, data-driven entrepreneur, and he's also a man who loves frequent flyer miles, is what I would say. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's a creative thinker. He also is very strategic. He plays chess daily, so we have to watch it. Has a score of around 1,500 to 1,600, and I looked that up. That qualifies him as pretty advanced. Pretty impressive. And I uh, also looked into his profile. One of his colleagues gives David nine out of 10, with 10 being close to God. We won't go there. <laughs> we were excited to have you here. And we want to see the action when we let you loose, David. Wow. Great to have Good. you both. I mean, I, is that Grandmaster? I don't know what Grandmaster is in, or is it Master in Chance? Grandmaster is around 2000, 2000 plus. Okay. Mm. What's holding you back here? I mean, come on. Do you have a job or something? <laughs> uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes you have to get the job done. And after that, it's a good play. I'm oh, playing man. Some sticks. Just tell your CEO you got to get that chess score up. Anyways, let's get to what we're talking about here. We're talking about casual games. And we're looking at this report from Liftoff. CPIs are way up. Cost per install is up. 45% this year versus last year, to almost $2. What's going on here? Jonathan, let's start with you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously uh, a very, very interesting year in comparison, especially to last year, um, because as it's highlighted in multiple reports, uh, last year we had the start of the pandemic, like really kicking in and, and, and disrupting mobile marketing uh, worldwide in the sense that uh, especially in the mobile gaming space, casual games were benefiting from people being at home more and then have uh, some more time dedicated to games or gaming in general. Uh, and therefore the CPIs really dropped uh, for a period of time and which was a great, you know, time for, for, for mobile games UA. Uh, and then since then, uh, as things have kind of settled in, in, uh, during the pandemic uh, and the lifestyle, uh, of many, many people have, have changed accordingly. Uh, now in 2021 experienced kind of the continuation, not of just the pandemic, but, um, also, uh, with the technology, uh, the technology changing, uh, the way we view tracking, you already mentioned it, the mobile uh, tracking environment is, has changed uh, significantly on iOS and, uh, that kind of caused a huge wave of reactions across the industry, um, including us and many clip we had to really pay close attention to what it means to, uh, the marketing costs on iOS versus Android. And I believe what we're seeing here is a combination of things. It's not just associated to, uh, uh the loss of IDFA or tracking. Um, especially when we talk about CPIs, we find that, uh, there is 
definitely a CPI that we can still kind of evaluate, but also an eCPI that we keep in close eye on. So the overall game health, uh, depending on what kind of journey you're stepping into with, with how much reliance you come in from the UA side. And uh, I think we have a great ways of eva evaluating the true value of an install, where an install comes from. If you look at the overall, like have a portfolio view. And, but it is a fact that uh, it, the competition, now that we kind of are in this time period where this whole wave of reaction due to the IDFA changes has kind of now settled. Now people kind of have figured out their own ways of dealing with it. They're stepping back into really scaling up on I iOS. They really try to uh, capture some of the market share they may have lost or they want to regain some of the power you know, on UA, especially on iOS. And, and that is that you can see and observe in, on those benchmarks, market benchmarks that's released by LiftGolf. I love it. You've got the CPI that uh, is getting reported to you and you've got your effective CPI, which is you know, kind of what you are actually seeing. David, uh, what are you seeing here in terms of CPIs going up? I completely agree with Jonathan on this case. The pandemic has introduced two type of, uh, let's say, new type of gamer. I like to call them new gamers. People that haven't played any game in the past, but during the pandemic, they actually have a lot of free time on their hands. So the natural thing is to pick up your phone and start playing. On the hyper casual side, we did see a massive decrease in CPRs, but in the past year, let's say eight months ago, we see gradually increase because in the end of the day, all of us are competing on the same audiences. I'm talking about, for example, on the hyper casual, casual side, we're competing for the same audiences. So naturally the ad placement costs will be increased gradually. On the other hand, you have also the iOS shift. That means most companies these days, including ourselves, move the entire budget from iOS to Android. So that also caused an additional increase in CPIs and also on the CPM on the bottom level. Now in hyper casual side, we are heavily dependent on low CPIs. For example, the batch for industry, if you want to, let's say, market globally your game, you have to reach a minimum, sorry, maximum of 30 cent CPI because most of us are heavily invested in ad revenue only. Mm -hmm. So on one side, you see gradually increase on the CPIs because of the new gamers and heavy shift from iOS to Android. But on the same side, you see massive companies like Zynga, Iron Source are actually buying hyper casual games, companies like Ronic for Zynga. And in Supersonic, everybody knows Iron Source and so on. So you see more games are coming up, a lot more games, but you see also an increase in ad and games within that vertical. So everything basically causes all the prices to go up. I'm seeing prices on, for example, hyper casual, which usually you're going to see the same cost at strategic games or more heavily invested games. It is really interesting to see the consolidation, right? Because uh, maybe Zynga can afford to pay more for that user because they're going to cross promote that user across other games. They're going to get that user in two, three, four games or something like that and make more money from that user than maybe an independent developer or publisher. That completely true because if you look at it, once a company like Zynga acquire Rodic, when they're actually getting a ton of users, let's say cheap with minimum CPI, this is only a prediction of mine, nothing uh, concrete. Those companies are buying the hyper casual in order to cross promote, you know, because eventually you're buying a, a user for 20 cents while I'm guessing only Zynga unusual, let's say, uh, CPA is around a dollar to even three. So once you do the cross promotion for cheap users and try to direct them to in-app purchases, that, that move again anticipate it to be work, to be, to work really well for them. So we talked about the metrics, you know, CPIs are up, which isn't great news. And what we wish was up is actually down because ROAS is down. And the liftoff report shows us that day 30 ROAS dropped from 37% year ago to hovering around 29.6% now. Again, a shift. Jonathan, what's going on here? Well, first of all, um, it makes sense, right? Because if the cost goes up, it is the recruitment yeah. period is lower. So it's a natural, 
uh, reaction in that sense that if the CPI goes up, the return on spend tends to go. Yeah, but thirty-seven percent, Jonathan. Yeah. must keep you up. It is. It is. It is interesting. So this is a market and uh, a uh, benchmark. Um, and and from 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 what we are seeing on our end, uh, the the return on ad spend there are some fluctuations, and but but it also is connected to the fact that uh, a lot of especially games that have uh, now inhabited a bit more of core features, right, uh, in terms of monetization or have reached longevity a bit more with with uh, interesting uh, features to retain users. I think um, and. Uh, and uh, Especially on our side, we can we can also afford to uh, uh, aim for lower return on ad spend goals as we see retention for for some of our key titles uh, going up. So I think there's some interesting dynamics happening as well that uh, the evolution of the game design of how people are engaging with games, the, the player player profile, as David mentioned, right, has changed. So um, we have games and. Um, We'll be very proud of the fact that we have very engaged users and uh, th their lifetime is actually longer than um, what we ever expected before. So obviously your recruitment time from a marketing point of view can be uh, longer. Uh, and so with return on ad spend uh, trending downwards, it's always a matter of what do you benchmark it against internally? Because every company, especially also what we do with our BI team is we set return on ad spend goals per game, per country, per platform. We know exactly what is the, the, the pro player profile we're seeing and what kind of return on spend we need to see. Um, but it is still a challenge, especially for those who may not have necessarily access to the right tools or the right reporting to really measure the long-term impact of the data to return on spend on, you know, sometimes day 90, uh, recruitment or in an RI after 12 months. Um, so it is very tricky, uh, and, and also what's so important with the return on ad spend is how it's plateauing, um, and after day 30, right? What's the behavior then? So if I know whatever percentage I'm reaching on day 30, what does it mean for the, my day 90? Um, so that's why, especially now with, with tracking being so limited, uh, uh, my advice is to really invest in, in, in technology or, or in building up team of specialists to dedicate to the, the forecasting of such trends, right? Of, of seeing what mm -hmm. the lifetime value can look like now uh, and how uh, in-game features, uh, new monetization models, any cool, cool new items you can introduce or, you know, points of interactions, how these things can impact your, your player lifetime. Okay. So some mechanics Actually, perhaps to, uh to boost retention, to look at that, to work at that. Yeah. David, if part of this is about the mechanics to keep users in the game longer or to increase LTV, um, that's one way. But then again, what happened to Hunt for Whales? Is that one way to plug this or are there other approaches that you're looking at? Uh, we, we have the, let's say, the privilege not to look at day 30, to be honest. At Hypercasual, you mostly look at, let's say, you start from day one and day three was, and then we are heavily progressing to day seven and day 14. So for us, day 30 is usually non-existing. However, the competition is up. It's more difficult to keep users and retain them and keeping them from churning out. So you have to look at the play time and the retention, like Jonathan said, especially in hyper-casual games. But the good thing, the pandemic, uh, the good side of the pandemic was really good to us. We see a massive increase in game time and you see more, the actual, the new thing, you see more developers, uh, let's say a publisher, but it was with the resources, are developing meta games in order to keep the game from dying or keep you milking the game after the churn point has already reached. You can take, for example, uh, Archeo, Hyper Casual from Hobby. And so that's a really good point. So that's one way for developers and publishers to actually get around the turning point of a game, especially in hyper casual, because usually you develop the game within a week to a three, and then you have a really good few months, but usually then because users are, let's say, are more prone to test new games, especially in the hyper casual. So you have to keep milking the, the users and the game, even after the turn point already reached. So big companies. 
up the, let's say, up the time and the bandwidth to invest more money in Meta. But smaller companies, smaller, let's say, indie developers just shut down the game and forfeit. This is a challenging segment to be part of. I mean, you're, you're turning around games in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Jonathan is, is looking at his D30 and wondering what that means for D90. He's doing that <laughs> off of on iOS, a data point that is probably coming in on D1. <laughs> because he's getting some data from SK Ad Network and he's got one data point, uh, at least in terms of where his initial uh, cohorts are coming from. And you got to put a lot on that initial one factor, one conversion factor you're getting back. Let's talk about maximizing player value. So whether you're keeping that user for two weeks uh, for the game you built in a couple of days, or whether you're keeping that user for 180 days, in a casual game that's really successful. What are you doing to maximize that player value? Is there anything new there? Uh, let's start with David on that one. So across the board, I'm seeing a new shift of implementation of retention strategies, especially for us. So one of those strategies can be, for example, player motivation. We're always trying to think what kind of motivation the player has to keep him in the game, to increase the retention, to increase, increase the player session time for each game. So for example, one motivation could be excitement. So you add a new excitement feature or something action. For example, like Papaya Gate did, they added the challenge. So you can compete versus another player. You can see that, for example, in the match three industry, you have Candy World versus Match Royale when you're actually competing in versus another player. For example, another model we actually implemented in our own games is what actually increases the score. So as you progress, you can unlock more items, which cannot be, which you haven't seen previously, let's say a year from now, a previous year about other games. So we're going to do skins, for example, and I've seen other games actually going into the NFT market, which is actually yeah. astounding because you see many companies actually branding their users and characters and as NFTs and with direct link to the, to the wallet. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's really interesting to see how it's going to evolve, especially in, in the entire cryptocurrency, let's say segment, but eventually we need to increase the player value in order to do that. We need to increase the player time within the app and yeah. in honestly, world of videos is a major part of that because once you're able to, let's say to get using initiated ads, instead of just interstitial, which are more intrusive and you get that reward to the flow. It can be a massive change for your LTP versus the ad revenue you are getting from each user. Because usually for world videos, you're getting double the amount compared to interstitial, for example. Well, David, that's the first time in my life I've heard of the match three industry. Um, so that, that, that's, that's cool. <laughs> that's a new phrase for me. I know that's a big game genre, but I did <laughs> a full industry, the match three industry. <laughs> there's a whole, there's a trade association. <laughs> they have conventions. <laughs> Mostly vertical. And an and NFT that's for it, John. And, the, and, and a bunch of NFTs for it as well, right? We got to follow up on that thread, but first let's give Jonathan, um, uh, you know, what are you doing? Uh, are you doing anything new here to maximize player value? Are you doing NFTs? Are we looking for NFT mini clip? I mean, that's, that's the buzzword, isn't it? That, that's, that's basically, uh, the, the topic uh, of, of the season, it seems. And, and yeah, I mean, we're, we're looking at all the trends and it's very exciting what, uh, uh, what interesting I think ideas. Yes. So I try on my B, my PR filter is operating yeah. right now. That was Good. yes. Mini clip is doing NFTs. <laughs> Could have been. Could have been. Well, uh, we, we have, uh, uh, lots of interesting stuff going on and uh, there's so much changing, but to, to your question, uh, uh, John about, uh, what are the things that we do in terms of player value? Like how do we keep the player value? Uh, so there are, I, I can separate it in two categories and there's the, the kind of the the classic framework of retaining users of, of things like, uh, having obviously is an element of competition. We have a lot of uh, successful sports games, right? Uh, starting with eight ball pool, um, a massive game with loads and loads of these players, are uh, uh, playing every day. So it's, in, it's interesting to have all these tournaments and the leaderboards and, and, and also the social interaction in, in clubs for, for players to interact with each other. So the competition element of just constantly engaging users by, uh, giving the chance to be the best in the league, right across the sport genre, is very important. Then there is, uh, uh, 
a strong emphasis on events. Like, uh, for example, just now in, in, in Ultimate Golf, which is uh, a, a game that has a very, very de dedicated community, we, we really uh, make sure we keep the game interesting with, with uh, interesting in-game events or season passes that really introduce some new cool narrative that is, is exciting, something new to experience for the users uh, uh, the game. And this week we, we are working with actually uh, Nico McBrain from Iron Maiden to uh, have a heavy metal week in Ultimate Golf. So wow. kind of launching uh, the golf game meets a heavy metal and have a really cool uh, uh, event with him playing with uh, uh, people around the world. It's, 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 it's something like that that really uh, shows um, to, the, to the people out there that the game is, is something they can enjoy over a long period of time. And every time they log in, they can expect something new and exciting. Cool. That is interesting. It makes me just think, John, one word, right? Hook. That's what it's all about. Exactly. I'm thinking Iron Maiden NFT, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in the next year, we can have a, another conversation. By then, we might have already the, the NFTs in place. Okay. We'll be back. We will be back. But in the meantime, we did start to talk about, because we got into the whole idea of, you know, the match three industry. And there's a lot of different genres going on in here. You know, there's, we talk about casual, but there's lifestyle, there's puzzle, there's simulation. You talked about the match three industry. What genres are doing great here? Maybe I'll ask you, David. Uh, I'm mostly in the hyper casual, like I said, vertical. So you can see the hyper casual. For example, if you look at Happen, top 10. Uh, top 10 games, US or worldwide, you can see seven out of 10 and Android are hyper casual games. If you go on iOS, you can, be, you can see the same thing. If you go to app and global regarding to all apps, so you're going to see at least two or three hyper casual games about TikTok. So I will definitely say hyper casual is the next, is already the big thing and will okay. and it will gradually increase more. Everybody's saying it's like it's going to reach its peak somehow, but it's been two years, three years, and I'm still waiting for that. It's massively increasing, and I'm excited to be a part of that industry because today, when you look at hyper casual, inside you can see mechanic for puzzle, you can see mechanic for simulations, and a lot of different mechanics in one game. Mm -hmm. and that was the old hybrid casual as well. So the mechanics are shifting there. Um, and that's probably what's giving it the longevity, you know, the surprise, the excitement, the experience of the game. That's what it's all about. What about you, Jonathan, looking at what you do at Miniclip, but also the industry overall, you've been there for a while, been there, done that. What have you seen? What do you see? Are the genres doing really well? Or maybe just which ones are the most challenging? In terms of genres, uh, well, to, to, to clarify, so obviously uh, from a Miniclip uh, side, we are... Uh, as a publisher, have a stronghold in, in the sports genre. So we have been able to really uh, fine tune the experience of like sport games, multiplayer sport games, uh, and introduce a, lot, a range of different sport titles, not just uh, simulation, but also management style. Um, uh, but that didn't stop us also from expanding to, to, to other genres over the last years, um, for example, working with it on, on, on the uh, puzzle genre war, um, and, and also looking into tabletop, like for example, we have, uh, Karen, which is a huge title in, especially in, uh, India, um, as in Karen, the traditional, uh, tabletop game, um, known, uh, in, in India. And, uh, I think when we look at the whole landscape of all the genres that are out there, you know, we have, we have very niche genres. Um, uh, and, and very uh, widespread genres like match three genre that has kind of evolved into, uh, uh like a play style that kind of combines the match three puzzle games with a home building for some player access as, as obviously, uh, taking the leap on, on that for, for a very long time uh, with other competitors kind of stepping into the same realm. And now with merge mansion, for example, uh, having instead of match three, have more of a merge element. So. There are certain gameplay mechanics that kind of conquer and, and, and dominate the, the, the genre space. And so we keep obviously a, a very close eye on, on what is out there, what, which games really have to appeal 
uh, what are the game mechanics that, uh, that, that people care about and, and what are the interesting iterations that they present, you know, the, whether it's, you know, something, uh, uh, like a interesting combination of puzzle game meets home building, whether it is, uh, RPG meets, uh, meets, meets three, right. Uh, for us, it is the same question. Like what, what, what is it that we can, uh, produce, uh, or can develop that is interesting, something new, refreshing, but is, is also familiar to the users based on the mechanics that have already been kind of, uh, established like the mesh free mechanic. And, um, it is, it is quite difficult if, if you pitch a new match three title, like there are so many, many match three titles out there. Like it is, it is so important to have something that makes games stick out because you will enter a, a market and a marketing frenzy because they, they, you have huge, huge publishers and competitors that they can throw a lot of money at, at the UA and squeeze out any new entry. Uh, quite easily. So it is, it is a very interesting genre, right? A very attractive genre, a very popular genre, but it, it comes with its cost. And I think, uh, there are genres like this one, but there are also, uh, other genres, sub genres that maybe do not get as much attention right now, or are just growing. Uh, and, and th there are some trends that also come up. For example, when, uh, Among Us became such a huge huge, huge, uh, game, right. Over the last year, like during the pandemic, perfect game for people to connect on like, and it was cross platform. Yeah. I certainly played a lot with friends and family and it was huge. And now obviously a lot of developers, publishers went and said, oh, this is the new thing, the new genre, let's step into it. But you quickly realized actually it was just among us and then no one really else, like a lot of, uh, other, uh, uh Participants of that genre have, have kind of failed to reach that same scale. And the same goes for Battle Royale, right? Uh, there is a very, very small list of, of competitors really dominating the market. Uh, and, and you have to be just very careful about these, these types, these trends for, for specific things versus the longevity of genres like Match 3 and how they combine different mechanics uh, to an interesting new product. Interesting what you said, Jonathan, about the entry, let's say, call it entry barrier to the market. So you can see, for example, in hyper casual, small teams can create booming and success, successful games comparing it to big studios with deep pockets. So up until now, let's say in the past two years, you can see a lot of small indie developers are getting a lot of traction, creating a ton of games. So if you look at the big studios, when you have quality over quality, here you can see both, you can see both the quantity and the quality is getting better step by step. So everyone can enter, but not everybody can make it. Love it. Love it. I, I was thinking, um, I want to see the match three genre and the battle Royale genre come together. I mean, I think that'd be an amazing, <laughs> I'm sure somebody's done it. It must, it must exist. Somebody has done, tried every, they've just put it in the blender, every sub genre and they've put, and <laughs> we'll create a and game. It's exactly the thing, John. It's, it, it's, it, that's one of the things that are so exciting about our business, about the mobile games industry, because these ideas fit, there are always new things coming up. And, uh, we see that, especially when we talk to developers, also we have a dedicated, uh, uh, commercial business development team, really talking to a, a wide range of, of, of developers, um, worldwide. And, and we see so many exciting things happening and, uh, yeah, it's, it's just the next big hit is just around the corner, whether it is a match of battle royale and match three, or whether it is something completely different. I think that's, that's the wonderful thing about, uh, casual gaming that, uh, there will be something new, and exciting, um, happening for sure. Yep. David just stole that idea. I know that he did. David just stole that idea. So, you know, I'm, I'm just you know, putting on, on, on alert here. I want royalties. I want royalties. <laughs> Did Clip is doing any NFT next year? I want royalties as well. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. We all get royalties on everything. Everything is an NFT. This thing is an NFT. I mean, this, let's get back to reality for a second here. Uh, we have to go a little quick because we are coming near the end of our time here, but we already talked about rewarded ads. We see that playable ads usage is way up. And I think it was you, David, that said rewarded ads, you're getting paid double. Uh, talk a little bit about rewarded ads, how that's working for you. 
what's really doing well there? Uh, let's say integrate, initiate, initiate ads is basically integrated into our user funnel. So even my niece is waiting for it. She, when she's playing a game, by the way, my niece is my favorite group control. Every <laughs> game we develop in-house or outsource, she's the one to test it. She's <laughs> my main tester. She, she's, she's actually looking forward to rewarded ads, which is integrated in the funnel because she wants to, let's say, increase the stage or get the extra line or just have another shot at the game. So naturally, if it's integrated correctly, either the user funnel, it can massively increase your ad revenue from each specific user for double of, again, like I said, double the revenue compared to interstitial. However, you can see a lot of competition will lead us to, let's say, to need more creative ways to advertise. Let's say like a rewarded interstitial, like add more beta, just it started like, I don't know if i a year ago, but it's getting a lot of traction just right now. So it's always important to innovate and look at always at new ad placement or new, let's say, creative ways to engage with the audience and keep his player his session time longer and longer. I think with playable ads, um, they have become far more accessible for advertisers. Over the last years, I remember like six years ago, um, uh, playable ads would be this, this very niche, uh, format that would require a lot of development time. We need to uh, dedicate it HTML5 developer to actually create it, uh, you know, variations, uh, quite, there's also quite a lot of work because you had to kind of code it, recode everything and, and add all elements to it nowadays. You have so many tools and, and, and services out there that really enable the, the creation of playables in a, in the most yeah, simplistic way. Right. And, and I think it makes it far more accessible. And it, we see also the correlation between hyper casuals and playable ads, because, um, like you said, David, then the, the, there is a new kind of player who is more used to enjoying games that are simpler to interact with like one tap games, right? You just single interaction game, uh, high school games, whatever it is that can be, uh, introduced as a playable app quite easily, right? It's, it's, it's very easy to showcase some, some of these, um, uh, hyper casual games in that way. And, and for us, uh, coming like from the sports genre, um, there have been some hurdles with, with some, uh, games. I can give you an example, actually, uh, able pool. So you have a pool table and you have the, the whole thing is it feels realistic. It's about the, the, the pool table and how the balls roll across the table, the interaction, every situation is your need, the way you put the balls and everything. Try to replicate that in a simple HTML5 playable app. That's not, you can't just replicate the value proposition of this game easily on a playable app. While other games, it's, it's easier to convey something in the playable ad. And, uh, our planning is really neat. Once you start working on playable ads, you need to be prepared to reiterate a lot. The first version you produce, do not expect the playable ad, you know, to work immediately. Just because it's interactive doesn't mean people will care about it, will enjoy uh, interacting with it. Um. Uh, so it has to be something interesting and appealing, something uh, that, that doesn't disrupt the user, um, uh, you know, enjoyment of whatever game they currently experience. And then there's like an interstitial or something popping up for playable ads. So that's key. I'll make sure you have a lot of variations. Um, and, and also make sure that, th that it's clear what the game is about, right. And, 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 and you reflect that value proposition of your game in a very, very clear way. Uh, it's also maybe as a last point, it's not necessarily just, uh, the playable app itself that works really well. What we are also looking is a combination of ad formats. You may want to have a video that leads to a playable end card. You want to have a playable ad that leads to into a static end card. You want to have some sort of combination of video, playable ad, static, you know, there are certain, certain ways networks, uh, uh, play around with the combination of those things. These are, this is very important because that can be the crucial bit that changes the way your metrics behave. I think like, uh, I completely agree with you, Jonathan. Iteration is super important. Like you said, there are so many tools these days 
uh, that allows you to iterate without any knowledge of coding with the click of a button. We're, personally, we're using our playable ads in all our games and we can iterate really easy with a complete tool that's not even an issue. But the, I think the major reason why we're seeing such a massive traction in playable ad, as you said, it's been around for six, seven years. So why are we seeing all that traction right now? You have so much variety on the market and users, it's not enough just seeing a video. The user wants to experience the game before they even download it because they, mm -hmm. their focus time is less than three seconds these days. It's 1.5 seconds if you listen to TikTok. In that perspective, the user wants to experience the game and playable ad allows you to experience that game even before downloading it. So if the user already came, let's say, press the placement of a playable ad, the retention in the actual game is really extremely high because he already experienced the game and decided to download it. So I think that's why playable ads are more performing in some cases, obviously, comparing to other placements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that makes some sense. Okay, cool. This has been amazing. It's been wonderful and it's gone over time, but it's all good. <laughs> Let's end here. Uh, I want your three top tips for mobile marketers in casual games heading into 2022. I mean, we come out of two years of craziness, right? 2020, it was all the pandemic and lockdown and quarantine. 2021, oh, well, we're open. No, we're not closing. We're open. It's also insanity. 2022 is coming up. What are your top three tips for mobile marketers and casual games? Let's start with you, David. Uh, I'm seeing many companies to be honest, just copying the success from, from their competitors. For example, I'm seeing good creative. I'm going to copy. I'm going to do the same one. My advice is to stay ahead of the curve. You can stay ahead of the curve by a simple, let's say my 80, 20, you can know 80% do what works for you, but always keep the 20% to iterate 20% to be creative. Try to identify the trends and swiftly act upon them. For example, I mentioned the seven out of 10 games on the top 10 in the US Android are hyper casual games. Just to give you an example, Squid Games have two hyper casual Squid Games already in top charts. Identify trends and act upon them really fast. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And Jonathan? For me, um... I, first of all, I agree with what David said about creative is super important. Creative is king. Um, everyone says that it's, it's true. Um, it's to make, make sure that, uh, given the overload of, of, of advertising in mobile gaming, people will see ads for mobile games all the time. And so, uh, you have to kind of overcome that fatigue that, that kind of grows with that as people are exposed to so much mobile game advertisement, you have to be that scroll stopper that you have to deliver that special something that eye candy that makes people actually, you know, go, oh, what is this? That's how it looks interesting. And it's something I want to check out. Right. Um, but aside from, from the creative side, uh, maybe an additional point here, uh, what's very important going forward and has been also for, uh, very important since definitely since the changes on iOS and the idea of iOS is, uh, pay very close attention to, to your mobile marketing techno technology and the way, uh, you uh, are predicting value or out of your, uh, marketing. So how do you make sure that mobile marketing stays a valuable investment, knowing what the future can bring to your business? Uh, that requires specialist knowledge. So, uh, my advice is really to invest in the right technology and, and the specialist knowledge to be prepared for whatever changes may be coming up also in the next year, because we know that, uh, the, the loss of IDFAs that mm, is maybe just one step, uh, of many more steps to come, uh, to what we believe is the right way to, to allow users to have more control over it. what is being tracked from them. Um, I think that's a, that's a good thing, good change for the end consumer, but it means that advertisers just need to be more aware of the technical demands in order to make their marketing more successful. 
I think he's almost saying that change isn't going to stop in the tank industry. I mean, I have a little talk exactly. by that, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. prepare for the unexpected. And, 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 and as David said, watch the squid. Watch the squid. I have, I've watch started the watching the squid. Watch the <laughs> squid and take care of your stack. That's what I'm hearing here. Exactly. David, thank you so much. It's been wonderful hearing what you have to say, Jonathan, as well. It's Perfect. been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the insights and the inspiration because it means creativity in ad formats as well as games. It's called for. It's going to be fun. We're just going to mash it all up and see what happens. An exciting year ahead. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. That was a lot of fun. For everybody else who's watching, hey, stay tuned. Uh, we are on YouTube. We're on all the podcasting platforms. And if you want to be on the show, well, you know what? I think Peggy's somewhere around. You might be on LinkedIn, Twitter. I might be as well. Check us out and have a wonderful day. Bye.